Welcome. Um, today we're going to do Pashas Vayera. So, Pashas Vayera starts when Vayera, uh, Vayera El Vashem Berlin Mamre, Hashem was talking to him. And then we have the whole story with the Malachim came and uh, they he fed them and then um, they told Sora that she's going to have a son and then we have the whole story with uh, Avram Davins for Stoim to save Stoim and this whole story so there's a big machloikas in this, in this parsha between the Rambam and the Ramban very big machloikas so I'd like to first start with the Rambam and I want to tell you what the Rambam's principles are about Nevoa prophecy. So first the Rambam says in um, in Chelek Beis Perik Memvov, the Rambam says in the Moira that when a prophecy starts and then you have things happen afterwards, you can assume that all that is part of the prophecy. In Sefer Yeshaya, Perek Chof, uh, the Rabbi Nishlelem tells Yeshaya he should get undressed and walk, uh, you know, naked and barefoot, and he did that. And then the Hashem says, just like he walked for three years naked and barefoot. So the Rambam says that it doesn't, it's not, it, it's not likely that the Rebbe Shalom told Ishaya to walk around for three years naked and barefoot. But this, that he said, just like in a dream, a person has a dream. The dream can compress a long time in one dream. You could dream that you went to a different country, and you could dream that you got married and you had children, and all these things even though normally they would take a long time, but in the dream it could all be compressed into the same dream. And it's the same thing with a Navua. When you have a Navua, you could have many things happen in the Navua that, that seemingly would take a long time, but it's really all part of Navua and everything takes place during the time that, that the Navi was having his Navua. When Yeshaya, uh, he says, Vayas Ken Yeshaya, and he uh, got undressed, that he walked barefoot, that, that does not mean that he actually did it. The Rebbe would not tell him to do such a thing, but it was all happening in his Nevoa. When the Rebbe told Hosea that he should marry a woman of ill repute and he should have illegitimate children, and he went and he did it, and he had, he had the child, uh, son who called him Yezreel, and he had a daughter called her Loiruchama, and all these things which are symbolic of, of, of different things that the Rebbe Shalom was going to do, it didn't happen in real life. He didn't, the Rebbe Shalom would not tell Hosea to go marry a harlot. He wouldn't do that. What uh, all this is happening, it happens in the Nevoah, even though it takes place over a longer period of time. And the way you know that uh, there has to be some kind of indication in the Psukim that Nevoah has come to an end. Like you see in Pashas Lech Lecha, by the, by the Brisbane Absorim, first of all, in the Nevoah that he tells him that he should... Uh, that he should make, uh, the, give him the midst of making a bris. So at the end it says, Vayichal adaber itoy, Vayal elokim al Avram. Hashem has finished talking to him, and then he left, the, the Ruach of Nevoah left him, and that signals the end of Nevoah. By the bris ben Absorim, at the end it says, Vayoy mahu koras Hashem is Avram bris leymar, and that, that is also a signal that the, that the Nevoah has come to an end. But otherwise, the Nevoah continues until we could see somewhere in the Psukim that it's come to an end. That's one thing that the Rambam says, one principle. The Rambam has another principle in the Nevoah. He says that a person does not see a Malach. A person can't see a Malach. A malach is a Ruchni. A person doesn't see a Malach. When a person sees a Malach, he's having a Nevoah. 
He's in a nevua. That's how he sees a malach. And it's only in his mind and his imagination. But in real life, bahokets, when you're awake and not a nevua, you don't see a malach. So he says the whole story with Bilam, that Bilam with the, the, you know with his donkey and the whole story he says that that was a nevua. It didn't happen in real life. The donkey did not speak. It was all in his nevua. But uh, how do we know? Because he saw a malach. He took a look and he saw a malach. Obviously, if he saw a malach, he was in a nevua. And this whole episode with his donkey that was talking to him, it was all part of the nevua. That's what the Rambam says. So you'll ask me why uh, one of the things that was created Ben Hashmoshes was, I see, you wanted to ask for that. One of the things that was created Ben Hashmoshes was the Pia Osain. So why did the Pia Osain have to be created Ben Hashmoshes if it never really happened? It's a very good question. And we'll talk about it when we get to Pasha's Bullock. There's an explanation for it. The Ramban vehemently disagrees with the Ramban. No, oh, one second. According to, so according to this, the, the Rambam says that the whole story of Vayera and the Malachim came and everything was a nevua. The Malachim didn't come. They, I mean, there were no... Uh, it didn't really happen. It was all things that he saw in his nevua. Now, this nevua, uh, uh, a Navi, cannot... Has, let's say he has a nevua in a chalom, in a dream. You can't have two neviim in the same dream. However, Vayera, it was a mara, it was a vision. So in the vision, you could have two Nevi'im. So Avram was the Navi, and Sora was also a Nevi'ah, and the Malachim spoke to Avram, and he spoke to Sora. But Yishmoel, who appears in this story, didn't really appear. It's all part of the Nevoa. The, the two Nevi'im that were in this mara, they received the Nevoa. But And then, if you see at the end of this whole story, then he goes and he... He uh, he davens for um, for the for Sadaim, If you find so many sadikim, if you find so many sadikim, all this all this is also going on in the nevuah. And after that whole thing, it says, "Vayelach Hashem kashakila l'daber it el Avram, v'Avram shav l'makaymai." That this this was the end of the nevuah. So from Vayera until that point where it says, "Vayelach Hashem kashakila l'daber imay." Until all this was one continuous nevuah, the visit of Malachim and Avram davening for Sadaim. The Ramban is vehemently opposed to this and this concept that you can't see a Malach, because he says that what happened when the Malachim came to Sadaim? So, <laughs> so he had the same question. The Ramban asked the question when the Malachim came to Sadaim. So, so the whole story that happened, Lloyd brought him into the house, and uh, the people of Sadaim, the answer of Sadaim, said, give, give them out to us. They wanted, they, they, they wanted to harm these malachim. So he says, even if you say that Lloyd had nevua, a certain level of nevua, the Rambam says it's possible to have a very, very low level of nevua, like Hagar says was not a nevua, but the, she could see a malach because that was a certain level of nevua. Maybe Light also had that level of nevua, and even though he was not the greatest tzaddik. But the Anshe Sdaim, how did they see the malachim? Were they, were they nevuah? How could they see it? This is what the Ramban asks on the Ramban. So, it's a machlaikas, fine. The Rambam holds that you cannot see a malach, and the Ramban holds you could see a malach. But the Ramban, the Ramban has a very good question on the Rambam. How did the Anshe Yisdaim see the malachim? So I want to offer a solution to this. The Rambam says in Chelek um, Aleph, Perek Memtes, he says that it was expelled from Gan Eden, so it says that the Pasuk says there was a lot of cherif and misapechas. There was a flaming sword which was revolving and that guarded the entrance to Ganeidin that nobody can come in. So the Rambam over there brings a medrash that it, there was no flaming sword. There was a malach there. And the malach, when anybody came and tried to come close to Ganeidin, then the malach projected into the mind of that person the image of a flaming sword that was revolving. So people got scared, they saw a flaming, they, 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 they saw this, it wasn't really true, but in their imagination they saw 
that there was a revolving flaming sword, so they were afraid to go into Gan Eden. So, so, that, so the Ram says that sometimes a malach can project an image into any person, maybe even into animals, that if animals wanted to get in Gan Eden, the malach could project that image into their mind, and then they, then they wouldn't go in. So according to that, so we could explain what happened by Sadaim. So maybe they projected it into Leich's mind, but in actually into Light's mind. Or maybe Light had a certain level of Dvor, but what's the Anshah's time? So the Anshah's time, the Malachim projected into their minds that there were people who had come here. Even though the Malachim are, uh, are uh, Ruchni, they don't have any kind of uh, material um, presence. But they, they projected into the mind of the people of Stoim that there were people that come, uh, people from out of the city who had come to visit Light, and that was uh, forbidden in Stoim, and they came to attack them. Why? Why did they do this to Malachim? Why would they do such a thing? Why don't you just ignore the Anshah Stoim, come to Light, and tell him? that we have to take you out because we're going to destroy Stoim. So it could be that this was like a last chance for them, a last chance for them to, to, to turn away from, from their, their, their evil ways, that, uh, which, they, which uh, the, any guests that came to Stoim, they would, they would torture them and make sure they didn't come. So, th so now they were coming to destroy Stoim, so for the last minute, they gave them a chance. They came, they'll see them as people. And what are they going to do? If they're going to just leave them alone, then maybe they will avert their, their uh, destruction. But if they don't, that would be the last straw and they would be destroyed. So that's why the Anshah's Daim saw the Malachim, because Malachim showed themselves to the Anshah's Daim as people and gave them the final opportunity to, to treat Archim, to treat guests properly and not to try to torture them and and chase them away. This, I think, would be a solution for the way the, for the Rambam. I'd like to dis digress for a couple of minutes and to talk about a different topic, and then we'll circle back to this topic. Now, people that don't know me, and they look at me, and they see I have my payas rolled up behind my ears, and I wear a strimal and a bekesh on Shabbos, and I'm a ninth generation descendant from the Baal Shem Tov, and I'm also the center from the Toldus Yaakov Yosef, I named after him, they would think that maybe I'm a chassid. But the truth is that I'm not. Very, very shvach a chassid. The reason why I dress this way is because I come from a line of Galtziana Rabbonim, and that is where I connect, and that is how they dress, so this is how I dress. Not going to put on a, a Lutfish Kapata because I'm not connected over there. I'm connected to Galtziana Rabbonim. The reason why I'm not a Chassid is my grandfather's fault, my mother's father. My mother's father was an extraordinary person, Chaim Isaac Krasniansky. He, uh, he brought up a Frum family by the communists in Russia, which were, took a tremendous amount of Gvura. And, uh, and he was a very big Skvera Chassid. And not, not from America, he was a Skvera Chassid from, back from uh, Ukraine, one of the few Skvera Chassidim. And uh, when he came here, you know, he lived near the Skvera Chassid, in the Skvera Rebbe. And when I was eight years old, I went to him for Shabbos for the first time myself. I went and spent the Shabbos by him. That was before New Square was built. Square was a shtibel on Bedford Avenue, Williamsburg. My grandfather lived on U Street, and I went to for Shabbos. So Friday night, we were walking to shul. My grandfather tells me, you should know, the Square Rebbe is Ruch HaKodesh. This is the old Dalta Square Rebbe, Rabbi Yankee says, the Chesalik Lavracha. So he says, he has Ruch HaKodesh. He takes one look at your forehead, and he sees all your Averis. He scared the wits out of me. A whole Mayrev, I'm sitting there, and I'm, like, I'm, you know, afraid. After Mayrev, we go to say good Shabbos to the Rebbe, and I am uh, hiding behind my grandfather. And when we come to the Rebbe, my grandfather pulls me out. He tells the Rebbe, this is my anical. The Rebbe looks down at me, and he smiled, 
and I saw right away that he doesn't see. And that was it. That was it. And in that moment, I became a skeptic. I have to, just, just in defense of the square Rebbe, I do want to say that when he put on my tefillin for me, when I was bar mitzvah, the first time, and he told me that I shouldn't talk to my tefillin for a year. So I thought to myself, a year? A year I could handle. I could, I could not talk to my tefillin for a year. So I didn't talk to my tefillin for a year, and I, after that, I didn't start talking. My whole life I've never talked to my tefillin. So, but then I found out that the Square Rebbe told everybody else they should never talk in this film. To me, he said, don't talk in my film for a year. So apparently, he was able to look into my head and know who he was dealing with. But the point I'm trying to make here is that you have to be very careful what you say to a child. That, you know, he told me something like that, and in my own mind, I thought that it's not true. So that was it, so I became a skeptic. So, we have Midrashim. There are many, many Midrashim that are really strange. They're really strange Midrashim. And, and most Shittas hold that in general, the, the Rambam says this in, in the Moira, he says that Chazal used to, used to conceal um, you know, soydas or esoteric ideas of the Torah, they would conceal them in parables and make, th and in certain ways that the people that who understand could figure out what they mean. But, they, but they're not meant to be taken literally. The morale, for the most part, does not uh, understand uh, Midrashim, these type of Midrashim to be literal. He understand, usually he explains them as being figurative. They're just being, you know, misholem or parables or metaphors, and even uh, the Masha, who tries to, as whenever possible, to understand that as literally, but uh, maybe more often than not, he'll also say that it's not meant literally. When the Gemara says that Oigma Chabasham was Oiker Harim Fetoichnam Zebazeh, he would rip out mountains and cr and grind them th against each other. Rosh <laughs> says that's not what it means. The Rajba also has Pshatim why, why Chazal did this. So, so Midrashim, you have to be very careful. What does a Midrash mean? So if a Midrash means, um, if, it's, if it's figurative, if it's not literal, and today in the yeshivas and the Bisyakovs, the 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 rabbeim and the Morris use midrashim in their literal sense to bring excitement into the class. They make them very exciting. All these midrashim, and if that's not what the midrash means, then it's megala uh, You're saying wrong pshat. You know you can't do that. And even if it does mean literally, but if it strains the credulity of a child, then it's a very dangerous thing to do. I want to read for you what the, what the Sefer Hasidim, the Chassid says, Ein megalen agodo tumua lektanim. You're not supposed to tell a, a strange agodo, which is either in the Gemara and the Gadotah or in the Medrash, you don't tell it to children. Pen yoimer ein boi mamish. They're going to say it's not true. Ein boi mamish. You won't believe in this, you won't believe in other things. If you tell them a medrash, and their, their reaction is going to be that, nah, it can't be, then how, how do you know that they're going to believe in Kriyas Yamsov? If this is not true, then other things are also not true. So you're really undermining their Amuna and the Torah by telling them things that they may say that this is not true. He says, V'chein la'amiyoretz, don't tell ta'amiyoretz either. Shalom ya'aminu. They won't believe what you're telling them, so you shouldn't do that. So before a Rebbe or a Moritz uses a Medrash, which is strange and bizarre, and tells this to the class, before that, 
they need to find out, you know, either they have to learn themselves, learn all the mefarshim, see how, see, just don't take the medrash as it is and give it to the children. Learn what it means. If it doesn't mean literally, then certainly you shouldn't do it. Even if it does mean literally, better, better not to do it. Pick and choose your medrashim. You have a question, go to your rov, go to somebody, ask him a question. Is this a medrash that I should teach to the children or is it not? This is very important because you can undermine their amona. Which brings us back to Vashti's tale. Did Vashti have a tail? I once asked, I don't know, did she have a tail? So I once asked, the Aruch says she didn't. But I once asked the Choshevi, did Vashti have a tail? So he told me, and this is the correct answer, I don't know if she had a tail, but I know that she had something that Chazal called a tail. Okay, that's a good answer. What, is it, what was it? Okay, so you have, to, you have to investigate, you have to learn, what does it mean? But just to tell the children, Vashti had a tail, Maybe it's not. In general, you shouldn't tell them about Vashti's tale because she had to get, it, uh, you know, she was unclad. It's not appropriate to tell that, uh, that to tell that to the children. But that's besides the point. But did she have a tale? I was once speaking to a group of young women, women who had uh, graduated from uh, seminary, and they were talking about different things. And I asked them, "Do you believe?" I said, "A small group." Do you believe that Vashti had a tail? So they said, of course, you know, they, we learned that Vashti had a tail. So I told them, listen, this is a safe zone. Whatever you say here is not going to get out. It's not going to hurt you with the shidduch. Just tell me what you believe. So they started giggling and they said, a tail, a tail. So <laughs> apparently they didn't really believe it. So does that mean that, that, that now they don't believe in Kriyas Yamsov? I don't know. But it's certainly not a good thing to do to tell them something that, like he says, lo yaminu, they, won't, they don't believe it. You don't know. You, a young man once called me up, and he told me that, that he had gone to different, read different books, and he was a kaifer. He didn't believe in the Torah at all. Didn't believe in it. And he wanted to come talk to me. I said, of course, you can come talk to me. I think I could have helped him. But I didn't, I didn't take his name or his number, and he never called me again. So, but I asked him, what do you do? He says, I learned in the Kailo. He says, what? You know, yeah, I learned first, second, third Seder with Chavrusas. He learns in the Kailo. So I said, uh, does your father know? Does your Rebbe know? No. Does your wife know? No. Nobody knows that this person is a Kaifer. And he learns in the yeshiva because this is, the, this is his community. And this, in this community, you have to learn yeshiva. So he learns in yeshiva. And he doesn't believe a word of it. I mean, I feel very sorry for this guy. But, you know, who knows how many people in our community, because, because they want to be, this is their family, this is their friends, this is their community, so they do what everybody else does. But who knows? If their moon is really solid, we can't know that, and we have to be we have to be extremely careful to make sure that the moon is strong, and we don't have to we should not jeopardize their moon by telling them things that are, you know, that they may find not credible. So it does what did Vashti have a tail? So I just like to address this. The Gemara says two opinions. First opinion, the Gemara says, Parcha bot saras. She got uh, a rash, so she couldn't come because she had a rash. Okay, good. A rash is not, nothing very miraculous. The Rambam says in, in the fifth parak of Ovis that the Rabban doesn't like to make Nisim. He made the Teva, he wants the Teva to work. The Rabban made a Tanai with the Yam which, uh, but during the uh, Sheish may brashes that it should split that it should be kriyas yamsov. Says why the the yam is not a balbachira, is not a bardas. He can't make tnoim. What this means is that he built into the bria that the yam should split at certain times. That's what he built into the bria. So the nisim are built into the bria. If we find nisim, they're built into the bria. They should happen. I find it like not so. <coughs> 
why would he build into the Bria that Vashti should have a tail? What's wrong with a rash? So this is what the Gemara says. The first Lush in the Gemara says, Parcha bats harash, she got a rash. The second Lush in the Gemara says, Yorad Gavriel Asala Zonov. Avriel came, Gavriel came down and he made her a tail. Why didn't he say the same thing? Parcha Batsaras or Parcha Bazanov? That she got a Tsaras or she grew a tail. Why does the Gemara say that Gavriel came down? So I think that what it means is that just like we said before in the Rambam, that a Malach could sometimes project an image into a person's mind of something that's not there, but he'll make them think that it's there. So you're, to, to, to make a tail is really, really over the top. I mean, you could just make a, a, a tzaraz. But what happened here is that Gavriel came down and he projected into Vashti's mind and maybe into her, uh, her uh, ladies-in-waiting also that, uh, that she had a tail. And therefore, she didn't go because she thought she had a tail, but she really didn't have a tail. Anyway, that's what I wanted to say about um, this parsha, and uh, I think this is a very important point. To that that in general, when you deal with medrashim, that you're playing with fire. You're taking a medrash, which first of all may not mean what you say it means, and even if it does, it may undermine the amuna. Of maybe this young man that called me, who knows if 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 his first step on the road to Kfira was Vashti's tail or something like that? Who knows? And it's not worth it. You want to excite the kids, okay? I don't know. Tell them stories of Gedolim or who knows what. But to tell them uh, to take midrashim uh, that they may not find credible is really not what should be done. Anyway, going before at the at the end of this nevuah. So, the Rabbanishon says that that he has to tell him he has to tell him what he plans to do with Sedaim. Okay. So he says I know Avram, Asher Yitzav is Bonov, as Beisai Achrov. He's going to leave instructions for his children. Lasai Tzedakah and Mishpat. To do Tzedakah and Mishpat. Now, in the first mission of us, it says, Al Shloish Advarim Ailam Aimed, one of them is Chesed. Gemil is Chesodim. So the Mefarshim, Rashi, or Bein Yoyinda, they say, why does it say Chesed? Why doesn't it say Tzedakah? So they say because chesed is bigger than tzedakah. Because tzedakah you do with poor people. And chesed you could do with anybody. You do with ashirim, you can give eitzes. There are many different ways of doing chesed. So chesed is higher than tzedakah. Now we know that, uh, that Avram was the Amud chesed. He was the Amud chesed. So why doesn't it say here, Lasa is chesed tzedakah mishpat? Why is chesed missing here? Why does it say just tzedakah mishpat? So, the Rambam and the Moira, the second to the last parak, says there are three things. There's Chesed, Tzedakah, and Mishpat. It says, what is the difference with these three? So the Rambam says, Chesed is something that you have no obligation whatsoever to do. You don't have to do it. Oilam Chesed Yibana. The creation of the world was a Chesed. There was no reason why the Rabban Shalom had to create the world. He decided to create the world. It was pure Chesed. However, once he created the world, then it, is, it would be fitting, morally, that he should take care of the creatures that he created. That's called tzedakah. That they don't really have a legal claim, but this is the right thing to do. That's tzedakah. Mishpat means something that you have a legal obligation to do. So chesed means you have absolutely no obligation. Tzedakah means that you have a, a moral obligation to do it. And uh, mishpat means something you have a legal obligation to do. So if it would said here that Avram was mitzvah as bonov, they should do chesed, and it's mitzvah a kind of you have to. It's a mitzvah 
to, to fulfill the instructions of a person that dies or passes away, then any chesed he would tell them to do would be obligatory, at least it would be the right thing to do. So then it wouldn't be chesed. So he could not be mitzavad them to do chesed. He could only be mitzavad them to do tzedakah and nishpat. He himself was big bal chesed, and they should learn from his example that they should also be bal chesed. But he cannot give them instructions that they should do chesed, because if he gave them those instructions, then it wouldn't be chesed. Okay, a little bit further in the parasha. After Yitzchok was born, so Sarah felt that that Ishmael, who was older than him, would be is a bad influence on him. So she convinced Avram that he should send Ishmael away. So it's, so there's. There's a variation in the language of the Pasik. Don't worry about the youth, Hanar. He called Ishmael Anar. So then he went. It says, He gave her uh, bread and water. He put the yelled. Also, that she should carry him. All of a sudden, he's a yelled. V'yichlu amayim in achemas, v'tashlech es a yelled tachas achad asichem. Again, he's called a yelled. And then she said, "I want to sit far away. I'll erev be mois a yelled. I don't want to see the yelled die." V'yishmelukim el koyl hanar. And now we're back to hanar. Three psukim, three times it calls him a yelad. First it says a nar, then three times a yelad, and then it calls him a nar. What does this mean? So I, I would like to explain this according to a Gemara in Chul and Dav Chavdalet. The Gemara over there talks about, I don't get into it, the question of Gabi Tumba. The Gemara says that, that there's a difference between a zokin and a yelad. So the Gemara says, Ma yelad. What is a yelad? So the Gemara says, he could stand on one foot and tie his shoe. Stand on one foot, lift the other foot, and tie his shoe. That's a yelled. Rav Chaniyah said that I was able to do that when I was 80 years old. So, so the word yelled means uh, uh, an athlete, a strong fellow. That's what yelled means. So why was, why was he... Why was he... Um, and these three psukim, they're all talking about his debility. He couldn't walk. Chagar had to carry him on her shoulder. She put him down because, by, by, by Achad Asichem because he was, uh, you know, fainting. She said, I don't want to see him die. These psukim are talking about his debility. Why was he debilitated? Why was he debilitated? So Rashi says that Sora gave him a nine hour, she gave him a klola, that he should be she gave him an ayin hara, and he got a very high fever. So his debility came from Sarah's, um, from Sarah's klala. So what the Pasuk is telling you, that in these three psukim that talk about his debility, these three psukim are telling you he was a yelled. It's not that he was this little, uh, you know, weak, weakling. He was a yelled. Ishmael was a strong guy. And even though he was a strong guy, Hagar had to carry him on the shoulder and he was running the high fever. She was afraid he was going to die. But when we talk about him, we talk about him as a nar. By Yishmael Akim, we'll call a nar. We talk about him as a nar. In conclusion, I would like to say something about the Akedah. There's like a tremendous amount to say about the Akedah. And uh, maybe next year we'll talk about the Akedah. Mir Hashem. But I'd like to say what the Rambam says about the Akeda. The Akeda is showed the world of Rome's devotion. It showed him that he was ready to, to sacrifice his son to Rabbi Shalom. But the Rambam says that there was another thing. There was another purpose in the Akeda. 
the purpose of the Akedah was to demonstrate for all future generations what is prophecy. Prophecy, you would think a person has a prophecy. So maybe he has questions, maybe he's not sure what he heard, maybe he didn't understand, maybe this. So he's saying Avram, when he had his prophecy to sacrifice Yitzchak, if he had had the least possible doubt that maybe he was wrong and maybe the prophecy that he was hearing was not really what he thought it was, then no way would he have would they have taken Yitzchak and brought him up and tried to sacrifice him. So this proves, this proves that when a Novi has a Nevoa, it is, it is so real to him, it's as if it's more vivid, more real than anything in real life. It is 100% sure, and all the Nevi'im that are going to be saying Nevoa to Klal Yisrael, all the future generations, you could assume that their Navua is, unless they're a Navi Sheker, but the true Navi, you can assume that his Navua is 100% true, that it came from the Rabban Shalom, and there are no Sveikas in the Navua. That was established by Avraham, because maybe another Navi, maybe that's what he thinks, so he's warning people to Tshuva. He's not sure, but he thinks so. But what Avraham showed is that Navua is 100% for sure. Definitely happened. And this is one of the lessons, it's not, the Rambam doesn't say it's as the main lesson, but it says it's also one of the lessons that we learn from the Akedah. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you again next week.